Raphael. Um, welcome to the webinar, Psychoanalysis, Sound and Music and Silence. My name is Laura Katz. I'm from Buenos Aires, Argentina, full member of the IPA and FIPAL. I will thank Mariano Ruperut for inviting me to be the moderator of this webinar. Uh, I will begin this webinar talking about the topic or what will be developed with two quotes of Freud. On certain occasions, Freud uses terms from the field of music as metaphors. In On the History of Psychoanalysis Movement, 1914, when he refers to the drives, he said, I quote, the primordial melody of the drives. I underline this, the primordial melody of the drives. In Analysis Terminable and Interminable in 1937, he uses the word tempo. I quote, the, the tempo of analytic therapy. It's important to underline that he didn't use the word time. Freud had in mind a sense of movement and of temporality that is present in psychoanalysis closely associated with music. In several years, oh, in recent, excuse me, in recent years, several psychoanalysis have reflected on the links our field can establish with music as an object of research. Due to the presence of music in psychoanalytic sessions and examining the role of the melodic as a channel of communication in the process of psychic constitution, new perspectives of reflection are open. For this reason, this webinar will seek to broaden this background revealing a space for theoretical clinical exchange on how psychoanalysis consider music and its irradiations in our practice. Before handing over the presentation to our panelists, I will explain briefly the format of how this webinar is going to function. It has two sections. In the first section, each of our three panelists will give their presentation. The second section is a question and answer portion devoted to the free exchange of select questions and ideas with the panelists and attendees. You will find questions box on the right side of the screen. If you would like to ask a question, please write it in this box. You can post your question throughout the whole course of the webinar from the very beginning. Please remember that questions will not be answered until after all three presentations from the panelists have been complete during the question answer section. Remember, you can submit questions to the speakers using the question tab in their control panel, and you can do it as soon as you wish. There will only be answer, as I said, question in the question and answer section. Well, now we are ready to begin. I will introduce Francis Greer, his editor-in-chief in the International Journal of Psychoanalysis and a training analyst and supervisor of the British Psychoanalytical Society. He's also a couple thera thera therapist. He works in private practice in London. He leads a seminar for the psychotherapist in the Fitzjohn unit of the Tavistock Clinic which specialize in working psychoanalytical with patients who would not usually have access to psychoanalytical treatment. He has written and edited papers, chapters, and two books on couple psychotherapy, including Oedipus and the Couple, 2005, Karnak, and papers from the International Journal on two Verdi operas, Rigoletto and La Traviata, on a gender approach to Beethoven, on musical in the consulting room and the music of the drives and perversions. Before training psychoanalytical, he was a professional musician. He gave the first ever solo recital at the Royal Albert Hall Proms concert in 1985, and in 2012 was awarded a British composer 
Award. The title of his presentation is The Music of Psychoanalytical Session. Francis? Thank you, Laura. When you go to a foreign country, foreign to wherever you live, you are likely to have an interesting set of experiences in terms of language and verbal communications. Let's imagine you don't speak the language. You hear others speaking it. You might be anxious, but also curious. Imagine you overhear a conversation between two persons and imagine that you're listening in, but they don't know you are. Something about the conversation makes you curious. Let's further imagine that you can't see the two people very well. So it's something about the sound that has attracted your curiosity and you're listening hard. You might suspect that it's a romantic conversation, a political argument, an angry lecture from father to son, an anxious lecture from mother to daughter, a furious diatribe from daughter to father, a bored sounding discussion. Whatever it is, one thing it isn't is the clarity of your verbal understanding. You don't understand the language. But I suggest that what has caught your attention is the music of the exchange. Not understanding the verbal signifiers shifts your attention to a different place in your own mind, where you attend more to your own oral, that's A-U-R, uh, to do with the hearing sensations, and you focus on the quality of the music that is being made by the two discussants. Remember, you can't see them properly. But if somebody pressed you to tell them what you thought was the most likely kind of exchange that you've heard, you would probably be able to say, well, it sounded like a father and daughter being furious with each other, or two people in love, or a rather scholarly but abstract discussion, and both sounded rather bored and not really engaged. I think almost anybody could do this. It's a well-known experience. Of course, you don't have to go abroad. You might hear two foreigners speaking in your own country. That might make it particularly fascinating that you don't understand their verbal meaning, and yet you are intrigued. Now imagine you are one of the participants trying to communicate when you don't understand the language spoken by the other party. Again, it's a common experience that you would pay particular attention to everything that is non-verbally comprehensible in your attempt to understand and to make yourself understood. You'd be likely to attend very carefully to the quality of the sound emanating from the other party, how it shifts and changes, how the melodic arc of the words goes up and down or down and up or remains flat, so that even something inexpressive becomes a particular form of expression. Or it might suddenly go up with a big accent, or it might suddenly go down so that you have to strain your ears to hear. It might sound voluptuous or didactic or contemptuous or scared. Because you don't understand the language, you are on a heightened alert to all these nonverbal parameters and most of them are conveyed through music. Now, let's imagine you do share the language with the person to whom you're talking. I suggest that you're likely to have a very different experience. You're likely on many occasions to be concentrating hard on the verbal content of your conversation, on the meaning of all the verbal signifiers you and your partner are using. You'll be thinking about verbal meaning while your partner speaks, before you speak, after you've spoken, you will attend to how your partner responds verbally to your words and so on. Yet, everything that has been going on in my previous examples is also taking place in this conversation. Only this time, you may well be paying far less attention to all these non-verbal categories of discourse. You may well effectively ignore the music. You might even semi-consciously intend to ignore the music. You might think that the whole point of the conversation is the verbal exchange and to reach a verbal meaning. So you don't want to be deflected from that focus by attending to all the non-verbals. And even when people talk about being attentive to, say, 
body language, they will often not include the music of the voice in that category. Now, I am a trained musician, and so I use my ears to listen to music all the time. Actually, I should probably say it's because I'm one of those people that intuitively and automatically tunes into music all the time that I became a trained musician. I think it works that way around. But I've also wanted to understand people and myself, and so I have become a psychoanalyst. And I've been surprised at the very dim recognition given by analysis to music. Of course, I mean music in the psychoanalytic session, not to music per se. Freud made out that he had no musical ear, but he was a close friend of Max Graf, one of the leading music reviewers in Vienna of his time, who became a founder member of Freud's Wednesday meetings and whom Freud invited on several occasions to make a musical presentation. Max Graf was also the father of Little Hans, who went on to make a career in stage design within opera. Freud found himself humming arias from Don Giovanni, and he sang to his dogs. Melanie Klein played the piano, including within psychoanalytic sessions. She played to her famous Analysand Dick and made interpretations about music. Yet, early analysts, perhaps influenced by Freud's suspicion of music, which I think he feared might be close to something like mysticism, which could undermine the scientific integrity of his new science, avoided music. Klein, the music lover, wrote the first article in opera that appeared in the International Journal on Ravel's opera, L'Enfant et les Sortilèges, which is a very interesting article, except that it doesn't say one word about the music. So music for many years remained essentially something like a particular interest outside psychoanalysis, or within analysis, it could be used metaphorically. Authors would write about how musical something might sound. This would restrict even the metaphorical use of music to being tantamount to being harmonious. Once psychoanalysis began to tune in more attentively to affect, which particularly happened with the turnabout regarding countertransference, so that the affect of the analyst was now consciously noted, everything about the emotional exchange began to hove more into focus. Even so, if that happened in the 1950s, a groundbreaking change, I believe, came with the wonderful paper by Didier Anzieu on the sound envelope in 1979, in which he theorized that at a primal level, the baby had an experience of being engulfed with mother in what Anzieu named as a sound bath. And you stopped thinking of music as only being about harmony. The extended clinical example in Anzu's paper is of a highly negative, extremely dissonant sound bath in which he considered that his patient had been raised, bombarded by the different kinds of dissonances emanating from his mother and his nanny from the earliest pre-verbal level of his life and continuing for many years which Anzu considered to have a primal importance in the very disturbed makeup of his personality. Interestingly, although the description of the clinical treatment shows that the patient made many improvements and developments, the one rather obvious point that Anzu does not make is that, according to the logic of his argument, the new sound bath of the patient and Anzu together in their psychoanalytic couple must almost certainly have been one of the main deep unconscious ingredients helping and enabling the patient's recovery and development. Then came Daniel Stern's focus on attunement in 1985. His brilliant work attended to the musical shapes and games played between mother and infants. Similarly astounding work has come from the team of Colwyn Trevathan and Stephen Mullock who in their notion of communicative musicality 
have shown not only the ubiquity of musicality in all areas of humanity, and indeed of animals as well, but particularly have demonstrated the immediacy of musical interest and apperception and communication in infants just a few hours old. All these researchers show how often, how it is often the infants who lead very actively musical communication and how in health, mothers and infants reciprocate and, alt and alternate and alternate, taking the musical lead and following the lead. I believe there is a direct developmental line between these duets at the start of life and the duets in our consulting room. So without spelling it out much more, I'm sure you can see where I'm going with this, what my main drift is. In my experience, patients bring along with their particular idiosyncratic set of object relations into the transference, counter-transference relationship with their analyst, their own music. The music of their objects, very many different musics of their different internal objects, harmonious, disharmonious, loving, hating, joking, teasing, seductive, sadistic, masochistic, even the musics emanating from their different pets and their relationships with them. As of course, the analyst has a full set of musical object relationships, which they bring into the analysis. Returning to the start of my paper, if you were a foreigner listening in, what you would hear is the music of the analytic exchange, the sound bath. You might hear the old sound bath, meaning that the patient, particularly at the start of an analysis, might success successfully trigger a set of musical responses from the analyst that might resemble the music of his internal world with its roots and the music of his earliest familial history. Gradually, as the analysis continues, you might hear the music change as both parties interact and affect each other. Hopefully, and here are the ideals, with a rather schizoid, cut-off patient whose music would likely be flat and non-communicative, their music might become increasingly expressive. With a highly disturbed patient whose music was primarily dissonant and likely to be explosive or suddenly silent, their music might begin to encompass harmoniousness and it also might begin to become musically logical. The patient whose music was always harmonious and nice, their music might begin to encompass the music of disharmony, anger, distrust and hatred, and vice versa. But it would never be on its own. The music of the patient never exists on its own. It is always in duet with that of the analyst. And there is so much to be said on the subject of the way the music of the analyst affects the relationship. But perhaps that can wait, it might fit the discussion, as can the little matter of the relationship between all this music and the actual words spoken by patients and analysts. One final point. You will have inferred that what I'm particularly interested in is what I think of as the actual music sung by the duet of analyst and patient. I'm not primarily talking about music as metaphor, which is how this subject is normally approached analytically. I'm interested in the actual pitches, their loudness and softness, how they relate between the two singers, and all the musical parameters of timbre, rhythm, melody, expressiveness, and so on. The real deal, the actual music, and how that relates to the emotional and verbal content of the analytic exchange. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Francis. Very interesting, your paper, very interesting. Well, uh, now I will introduce uh, Daniel Rohr. He's a psychotherapist in private practice in Brazil. He graduated and obtained a master's and doctorate focusing on psychoanalysis. He has participated in a psychological conference in Finland, the UK, and Greece. His paper, Oedipus Goes to the Opera, was presented at the conference Psychoanalysis on Ice. 
uh, number two, second, uh, held in uh, Reykjavik, Iceland. Such writing and its requel being published by the International Forum of Psychoanalysis. His research focuses on operas and source, sources of clinical knowledge and music education in clinical training. Daniel has published several articles on music and psychoanalysis, both in English and in Portuguese. Uh, for this occasion, the title of his presentation is An Area for Antigon, a Musicological and Psychoanalytical Study. Okay, thank you, Daniel, for Thank you, Laura. Uh, there are some slides, I believe uh, Matthew will display them. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to congratulate the, um, the IPA for um, promoting this uh, rare event when uh, specialists can discuss uh, music and psychoanalysis. <laughs> The, the rarity of this occasion uh, may be related to Freud's uh, alleged resistance to music, which is, of course, a, a paradoxical or rather ambivalent uh, issue, for he was uh, known to be an opera lover, and uh, yet uh, he was called sometimes as an unmusical person uh, by the likes of Ernest Jones and uh, Marie Bonaparte, uh, but not without reason. For me, uh, this research, can, could you please uh, pass Max, Ma uh, Matthew, sorry. Yes, uh, sometimes the, the, the ground for this uh, conclusion that Freud was unmusical is based on his uh, uh, incapacity to understand how uh, music has such an effect on him and uh, he described himself uh, this incapacity in his 1914 study on Moses and we have uh, an illustration from the original paper in the left and uh, of course he uh, Freud returns to Moses in uh, his uh, 1939 study, 1938-39 study, uh, in which he de-Judaized Moses by making him an Egyptian. The next one, please. Uh, for me, uh, studying Antigone, Antigone was a necessity because uh, after studying uh, doing a, a thorough research on operas based on the Oedipus myth, in which o Oedipus appears as the central role. Uh, of course, uh, to fulfill Sophocles' trilogy, uh, I should go to uh, Antigone. But then uh, I found out that the uh, answer to this question, why Antigone, the, the answer can be only one. So, and, uh, it's another question. It's a why Oedipus uh, a question which classical scholar Simon Goldhill uh, answered so well in his analysis of uh, philhellenism in 19th century uh, German and uh, how it had an impact on Freud. But yet, something else should be noticed uh, which is uh, lacking in Goldhill's analysis. Next one, please. Uh, Freud mentions Antigone in a single moment in all of his uh, works. It appears in his 1905 study on jokes uh, when Freud uh, recalls uh, the answer of uh, uh, Berlin artists to the criticisms they received of, the, of their production. Uh, their production lacking, lacking in antiquities, uh, and the answer being antique oni, which of course uh, condensates uh, the, the name of Antigone and the, the irony to the uh, related to the lack of antiquities. Uh, of antiquities, and uh, of course, 
you may found you may find that uh, one particularly uh, one particularly element of antiquity is lacking uh, in this uh, Berlin performance. Next one, please. And uh, this element lacking uh, is music. Of course, uh, then Freud's single ma single mention of Antigone in all of his works is of a uh, play about Antigone uh, without music. And uh, the reason uh, of being uh, of it being uh, performed without music is that it was supposed to be a parody of uh, the 1841 uh, incidental music by uh, Felix Mendelssohn uh, that dominated uh, the 19th century. It was a huge success. Antigone uh, was actually already uh, a huge success. Uh, she was uh, Sophocles. Uh, Antigone was uh, indeed in the boost of Nefertiti might have to forgive me. The, the greatest achievement in the history of art. Uh, and uh, Antigone as a character was uh, loved by this uh, German romantics. Uh, there was the famous Hoderlin's translation, there was uh, encomiums by Goethe. And then, uh, next one, please. And then, uh, but, uh, yes, here the, it's a, there's a short chronology. Mendelssohn's uh, composition was uh, dedicated to the new uh, king of Prussia, Friedrich William IV, and uh, it was supposed to uh, represent this new uh, ideal, this Greek ideal that was uh, embraced by uh, German Romantics. And uh, next one, please. Uh, and uh, this is the Théâtre Antique d'Orange uh, with its uh, modern website. Uh, I should return. I shall return this to a moment. Next one, please. We return now to the the question: Why Antigone? So, as I said, there was this uh, huge success success of display. Uh, which uh, George Steiner, uh, and I quote, uh, uh, told that it was not only the finest of Greek tragedies, but a work of art near to perfection than any other produced by the human spirit. Next one, please. Uh, in order to summarize the analysis of uh, Mendelssohn's version, I'd like to say that it was in part uh, uh, Antique and in parts modern. Okay, so the the antique part uh, is related to Mendelssohn' uh, profound knowledge of uh, ancient Greek, and uh, he used uh, as a libretto the, uh, the Donner's translation of Sophocles, which Freud later uses to quote Sophocles as well. And the uh, donor's translation is very accurate uh, in relation to Greek meter. So uh, when, M when Mendelssohn envisioned his score, he was uh, thinking on a Greek language and how it should have been uh, spoken or rather sang in an ancient theater in uh, 5th century BC, Greece. But then Mendelssohn uh, also used uh, modern elements uh, to, in his composition, for instance, uh, the wind bands uh, at the Parados, uh, which resemble rather the the Gutenberg uh, festivities uh, related to the 400 year anniversary that uh, event that took place, uh, and that uh, wind bands were uh, used often in, in such ceremonies. Uh, next one, please. So modern and antique. So Mendelssohn's composition was indeed a huge success in uh, in Europe, and uh, it was adapted by uh, Maurice Vacquery, uh, and, and it was performed in France uh, with uh, Mendelssohn's uh, score. And then the the librettists, the translators, uh, uh, invited Camille Sansan. Next one, please to compose uh, uh, an even more uh, authentic uh, in relation to ancient, Greek, ancient Greece, an authentic score. Uh, 
uh, and it, it followed indeed uh, musical guidelines by Aristophanes, for instance. And uh, but then again, Camille Saint Saint um, took advantage of uh, Greek uh, ancient music and uh, the recent uh, uh, archaeological discoveries to create a work of his own, which was also uh, very modern and uh, uh, also very uh, French or Provencal, if you may. Um, and uh, one particular feature is very interesting, and uh, I should speak of it in my last commentary, is that uh, Camille saint uh, used it uh, also as a resource Greek folk uh, popular music in his uh, composition. We will see it appear later uh, in Mikis Theodorakis and the Greek, other Greek composers. So next one, please. And here's a, a description of Antigone by uh, the librettist of Freud's favorite uh, uh, opera, Lorenzo da Ponte. He describes uh, Antigone as pretty much as being pretty much like her father. And uh, this, it was uh, sang by Brigitte Banti. Next one, please. Brigitte Banti, uh, who had this uh, famous Freudian slip, uh, she mixes the words uh, when uh, singing God Save the King to the King, uh, causing such an, uh, an embarrassment for the King at such occasion. And uh, we have this uh, many Antigones, the, the Antigone dream, as I would like to call it, uh, by Anna, uh, which Fred never analyzes himself. And the next one, please. Uh, yes, next one. Here's a poem uh, by Anna, when, uh, where uh, she speaks of music and uh, the healing power of music, uh, which goes uh, beyond words, uh, the healing power of words, uh, which we use in clinical practice so much. Next one, please. Yes, yeah, so, uh, one last uh, commentary before going to Theodorax and close my presentation is that uh, Freud himself uh, uh, was born in a family that uh, had a Jewish tradition in change that was changing from Hasidism to Haskalah. And uh, Freud himself, although he was uh, quite uh, orthodox in his view of psychoanalysis, didn't uh, follow the strict practices uh, as they are prescripted by the, the Jewish tradition. Uh, Freud adopted the more uh, scholar, uh, enlightened, uh, ideal uh, vision of Judaism that was uh, created uh, by no one else than uh, Felix Mendelssohn's grandfather, Moses Mendelssohn, right? And, uh, Moses Mendelssohn, who defeated uh, Immanuel Kant in a contest of monography with a metaphysical uh, proof of the, ex of the existence of God. But then uh, we are talking here about uh, religion in Haskalah tradition. Uh, we are talking about religion in a scholarly way. And uh, Freud addresses the issue of uh, religion in uh, many of his uh, writings, but then also uh, not with a, a religious approach, but with an academic uh, intellectual approach. And uh, for him, this uh, relation with uh, a de-Judaized Moses and the de-Judaized Judaism was a very intimate issue. And uh, we can see the same thing happening with Felix Mendelssohn, uh, who although uh, kept the name of Mendelssohn, uh, despite the, uh, the request of his relatives to abandon it due to um, anti-Semitic and anti Judaic uh, um, society, uh, anti Judaic. Sorry, just a just a short uh, broken my line of thought. But then uh, Freud. The, the the basic issue is that uh, Freud and Felix uh, Mendelssohn had 
to struggle uh, with being part of being born in a Jewish tradition. And uh, they worked through it in their own ways. Uh, Felix, by uh, pursuing Protestant music, uh, for instance, his St. Matthew's Passion, uh, which, uh, in which he approached Bach uh, in death, and Freud by means of the, the Haskalah tradition with, uh, with this scholar approach to religion. So as my final note, uh, I'd like to, uh, next slide, please. Uh, yes, just next one, please. Uh, and the next one, please. What is happening here? In uh, the seminar about Antigone Lacan, uh, states that uh, catharsis uh, would have this uh, effect on the body that is similar similar to rock and roll or hot music. Okay, it's very interesting because it appears on the, the Antigone seminars, series of seminars. But then, uh, although I don't totally disagree with Lacan, what is more musicological precise, so to say, is that uh, the, the music uh, of the tragedy, of the original tragedies, should uh, be closer to what Greek popular music is today. Uh, and I'm talking here about Vasilis Tsitsanis, for instance. Um, and uh, this music, uh, which appeared already in Sansan, composition for Antigone appears then in the this revolution in Greek music uh, which took place with Manos Hadidakis, Mikis Theodorakis and so on and uh, what is very interesting uh, and I quote here a Greek musicologist uh, he says that uh, when this music started to being uh, uh, composed uh, it uh, reminded the, the contemporaries of Theodorakis, uh, the Greek people, it reminded them of the parents, and I quote, their parents' musical taste. So uh, I think in a sense, then it's not like the, uh, just the effect of rock and roll, but uh, if we go with, uh, Greek, uh, with the Greek musicologists, uh, we would say that somehow today the, the music of, uh, of tragedies uh, would sound like uh, music that uh, our fathers and mothers uh, liked it and enjoyed. I left uh, just a last slide, but it's just as a curiosity to, to trigger the curiosity of the audience. You can show it for a brief moment, Matthew, but I'm Pretty much. This is a there's an analysis of this section by Lacan when he speaks of Ganymedes in relation to love invisible in battle, and this appears in Theodorakis' composition. And but then it's it's for those who are interested in the, the subject. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Daniel. Very interesting your presentation. And now I will introduce uh, Raphael Ornstein. He is a psychiatrist and psychoanalyst with a private practice in Brookline, Massachusetts. He is a graduate of and on the Boston Psychoanalytical Society and Institute faculty. He is an instructor in psychiatry for time at Harvard Medical School, and he supervised psychiatric residents at Massachusetts General Hospital. He's a frequent contributor to the Harvard Medical School Continuing Education course of psychodynamic psychotherapy. He enjoys playing the piano and in the sextet Blue Duck Jazz, a band with monthly jigs in local restaurants and clubs. Uh, you can look to stream their CD on Spotify. The title of the presenta his presentation is The Analytical Dialogue, Music of the Duet. Okay, Rafael. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Laura. And I want to especially thank Mariano uh, Rupertus for inviting me. And it really is an honor to be presenting along uh, su such luminaries uh, on the panel. So uh, thank you very much. 
um, you know, it's really remarkable uh, to consider how rhythm, melody, and harmony, music that is, is interwoven in our emotional lives, both as individuals and as members of the various cultural groups that we belong to. Uh, we're born, right, with a capacity to respond to music uh, the way a lullaby soothes babies to sleep. And I agree with Francis that maybe babies also are regulating us as well. Very much agree with that. And recently, um, seeing a toddler, you know, listening to music and watching a toddler unconsciously move and dance to the music is something really remarkable underlying that, that sense that we are born uh, musical. Um, music connects us to our bodies as we feel moved uh, to dance, and it provides a way to connect with others as we move together with the music. And music is linked to our experience of sensuality and sexuality uh, very much. Music can bring people together, erasing boundaries, whether it's a house of worship, a stadium, a concert hall. It can facilitate spiritual growth. I imagine too, music can also uh, drive people to war and other kinds of things. Music is a powerful instrument, I think, for both good and less good. We seek out music to modulate our psychic state, to stimulate or calm ourselves, and to seek what we feel to be particularly beautiful, the aesthetic pleasure of music. And I agree here very much with Francis that music is the language of affect and it brings affect to the words that we speak. Without the melody and the rhythm of speech, we can't feel the meaning of the words. And I imagine even when we read words, we bring a music even to our silent reading. Uh, maybe that's something to speculate upon. Music, so, is an important intra-psychic event as well as an intersubjective experience. Musical music is, also has a remarkable capacity to link emotional memories together, lasting across a lifetime. Whether we hear a few bars of music and we're back to 1970, 1975, or certainly hearing my father hum melodies from his childhood, it wouldn't take me but a minute uh, to feel all the feelings that he felt um, about his experience growing up. So uh, music it really trans. Uh, uh, we go across time. Um, and then of course, so we enjoy music, but there's also those composers uh, who create music and can express their feelings and tell a story through the music that they create. Jazz is a particular form of music, an African-American musical form uh, that took shape in the United States in the early part of this uh, century. And I wonder, you know, psychoanalysis and jazz share at least a time frame and maybe some common uh, commonalities in terms of exploring uh, sexuality and integrating sexuality into our popular culture. Um, more recently, the last half century, jazz has um, sort of emphasized more smaller groups that focus on uh, the spontaneous uh, musical expression of individual musicians. There was a period when it was a big, large band to entertain dancers, and it has become more of kind of chamber music highlighting the subtleties of, of musicians uh, interacting with one another. Um, it is a well-known adage for analysts to quote, listen to the music beyond the words. I think Francis was uh, telling us just that. Um, and as a psychoanalyst and a jazz musician, I find that conceptualizing the analytic conversation as an improvised jazz duet is evocative and it brings forth, I think, important considerations for our analytic process. Um, so where are we? Um, together, analyst and patient create the mel melodic and harmonic themes um, of the patient's life as it plays out in the unfolding process. So we can think about patient and analyst um, as they, as, as the treatment progresses, um, there is a story, and maybe again, echoing Francis, there is a musical story of the patient's life. And, um, and it's within the structure of the analytic frame 
and this initially co-created musical theme that improvisation with its capacity to deepen emotional exploration and expression can take place. So I guess what I'm saying is the initial engagement with patient and analyst. There's an initial story that is told uh, and it can be you know, a musical story. But, and if we think about, and, and, and as the frame of the treatment takes hold, it's within that context that improvisation can happen. And it's within that context that we can deepen uh, emotional expression and exploration. Um, so we can draw interesting parallels between a musician learning to improvise and the analytic patient. So here's a, the, the, the metaphor. So the musician must learn the basic structure of a song, its melody, its harmony, and the possible notes in the scale. So this becomes second nature for the learning musician to internalize as almost self-structure uh, the, the, the song that he is going to improvise upon. And then there's the role of the fellow musicians accompanying our, our novice musician. Um, and as the, the, the learning musician tries out uh, different improvised uh, melodies, it's the support of the other musicians, uh, uh, the support of the analyst that allows this improvisation to take place. And we can consider that this is a fragile moment, a, a, a chance for vulnerability and shame to try to improvise uh, when one hasn't, it's, it's like swimming without learning. You have to, to jump right in. Um, so there may be many failed attempts before something meaningful can emerge. Um, and a key factor here is the other musicians sort of listening for moments that make sense to echo them and to help the developing musician um, um, appreciate what they are able to produce. So over time, as this is repeated, uh, simple motifs emerge that link chords together with a melody. And these motifs then can be shared with other musicians who may be supplying an underlying rhythm so a conversation begins between the instruments and they take the motifs and play with them in different ways, repeating them, playing them against the beat in different ways. Um, and that's important, this sense of play. Um, also some of the instruments that play harmonies can play those harmonies in such a way to create um, a sense of ambiguity, which can open up more possibilities for meaningful improvisations. All the while, each musician maintains the structure of the tune, which allows a sense of play between the musicians and a freedom to venture outside of predictable motifs. So there's both, uh, I guess, the concept freedom within structure, um, individual expression that takes place in a group um, that that one in the same time as one is capable of interacting with a group, one has a greater sense of one's own individual expression. Um, this unfolding music has a momentum and a structure. For the musicians, a transitional space opens. Is the music happening inside of me or is the music happening from the people coming to me? It's somewhere in the middle. In the middle. And now, there seems to be many choices and many possible emotions to explore. And emotions emerge from this process that get channeled back through the music. And we can imagine then that our novice musician has found her voice. She has access now to a broad range of feelings and has learned to play with them with her peers. So I realize this is a very idealized version of development uh, of a musician, it happens in two paragraphs, but it is something I take into the consulting room with me, along with all of our great uh, teachers and theories, object relations, classical, self-psychology, relational. I take this jazz kind of idea about what might be possible for people to discover in themselves and in a group setting to be able to gather the strength and the emotion from the group to more further express oneself. So when I try to think of helping my patients uh, find a voice, 
this is this is what I'm also seeing along with my other uh, mentors and teachers. So now let's move and think more clinically about a patient arriving in treatment. Uh, and I think of them uh, then as a musician maybe who's lost the capacity to improvise or maybe never could. How do we work now in the consulting room as opposed to the music studio? The patient uh, doesn't feel like he has a voice. His story may be too painful or their feelings may be repressed, dissociated or unformulated. And um, here I like, uh, there was a recent paper by Henry Markham um, entitled Accompaniment in Jazz and Psychoanalysis. Um, I think it's in the dialogues uh, in 2020. And I really like uh, what he does here. He has the concept of the therapist as an attuned accompanist, accompanist um, to the patients. And here the therapists, uh, therapist in her attunement provides the structure uh, to begin the process of growth. Validation, empathic immersion, uh, facilitate engagement. Uh, however, the patient's words may not be animated enough to communicate the nature of the problem. Uh, so sort of as Francis was, was talking about uh, animated voices, sometimes our patients come in with voices that are constricted, um, passive, um, whatnot. Um, so here a patient may fall silent frequently or speak in ways that undermine the very uh, meaning that they wish to convey. So words are not working. Um, and, and the therapist needs to meet the patient where the patient is. And maybe the therapist has to be the first to begin improvising. If the patient can't do it, maybe we need to show them how it might be done, to try different ways uh, to respond uh, that make sense, to share as the therapist needs to share how she might experience the silence and what she makes of it. I think the important thread here is affect, is feeling. Is this an angry silence or a sad one? Is the patient communicating that he simply does not know how to go on and needs help to speak? Um, uh, thinking about a clinical example, I had a patient that uh, when, when they were out in the world, incredibly articulate, they were in a profession that needed them to speak fluently, but when they came into the office, they could barely make a sound or they would propose a sentence and take it back and propose a sentence and take it back. It was excruciating to be, <laughs> to try to listen. Um, but I focused and tried to sort of decipher what I thought the person might mean and offering it back to them, they were sort of amazed. I didn't even understand what I was trying to say and you've been able to put it together. Um, so in this way, my accompaniment and, and my attunement was critically important. It took over several years when we were able to explore the traumatic roots of this inhibition. And indeed, over time, the patient found their voice again. Um, so from, from, um, uh, from chaos to, to something that makes sense and communicating feeling along with the words. Other patients can use words and speech in a defensive manner articulate and compelling, the words can become an obstacle to relatedness and analytic progress. Here, following Markman again, we may need to be a different kind of an accompanist, one who must disrupt in order to be able to create meaning and movement. Some patients are clear that they want from what they want and perhaps need from us is simply to hear our voice just the sound of our voice is what they want they're not listening to the details to the interpretation i had one patient that would say to me um, um well I, let me say this that in the course of natural conversation uh the patient would evoke from me a kind of calm hopeful and reassuring tone. And um, however, from time to time, the patient would sort of require it on demand. Talk to me that way. 
of course, it, 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 it evoked in me a very ambivalent reaction because on the one hand, I understood that that tone was something that allowed the patient to become organized and feel held and contained. On the other hand, I felt sort of, you know, controlled as if this was some sort of commodity that could be, be produced on notice. Uh, but it speaks to the power, I think, of, um, of the musicality of the analyst's voice. So in this final vignette before I close, um, music itself played a an important role in resolving a transference, counter-transference impasse. What had appeared to me to be a classic Oedipal transference was more underneath about yearning for care and recognition from a withholding and sadistic mother. And it was not clear in the treatment how we were gonna get out of this um, um, uh, impasse because the patient was um, you know, triggered to, to demand and to feel this incredible yearning for more and more uh, of my um, involvement. And it, these were intense and very fragile feelings. In addition, there were many things that helped us work this through. But what I wanted to highlight here was a very modern solution um, the patient brought in her phone, which on it were various popular songs. Um, and one was a particular song that was from the tour of Mark Knopfler and Emmylou Harris. These are uh, performers that are actually contemporary to both the patient and myself. Um, these were not a romantic couple, but they, they had a beautiful collaboration on stage. Uh, and this was at the end of their tour and they sang two songs, one uh, songs of care and concern. One was called Why Worry? And then the other one is If This Is Goodbye. So they were, these were songs of tenderness and songs of loss. And we, sh we listened to these together and the music became uh, a representation of the patient's you know, very complicated emotional state. Uh, this song and this music became a container for our mutual reflection and recognition, a motif we could share like two jazz musicians. So in conclusion, I hope I have shown um, the usefulness of using music as a metaphor for our an analytic engagement. And also I hope uh, that I was able to touch on the experience that we have of music whether outside or inside the consulting room, uh, that can be a locus for emotional transformation. So thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you, Raphael. Very nice, your picture, your presentation. Uh, now uh, I would like to introduce the exchange between the three uh, of you uh, with two questions I, I will make. Um, so you can try to answer whatever the order you want. The first one, the first question is uh, taking like uh, the point to to begin to make the questions is what you, Raphael and Francis said. Uh, listen to the music to the music beyond the words. I think that music and words are in very close. You both talk and read Daniel also uh, taking the. Uh, Antigone and all what you refer. And my question is, in the analytical space, we try to move from the strict sense of the words. That, uh, that's the way to be willing to, the, to listen to the voices from the unconscious. The question is, could we say that the analyst reads the unconscious music scores that's one. And the other, more close to what Raphael presented, presents about uh, improvised improvisation, is if we can associate um, the fundamental rule of association, of free association, it's a very strong concept in psychoanalysis. Uh, could we say it's an invitation to improvise? Well. Mm -hmm. Who wants to begin? <laughs> well, I think on the one hand, um, 
I, I like the idea of unformulated experience, that somehow it, it is an emergent quality as the patient and the therapist engage. Um, uh, things begin to happen and and connections are are made and so um any, anyway so i th i think that in the interaction uh things are triggered and um i i do think free association and improvisation are very closely uh related and uh, you know maybe even one and the same and 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 i think about the preconditions of free association that is, you know, the structure, the safety um, that allow uh, for a meaningful free association. Um, because certainly there be, could be patients that uh, are all over the place, which is different from uh, a free association that seems to have some uh, seeking quality or, or that, that things do somehow come together. Of course, we have to sustain our uh, discomfort with ambiguity and uncertainty, um, but there. But at some point, we have a feeling when the patient is working on something, or there's a certain looseness and things are flowing, uh, as opposed to one that we may feel um, it, it may not be as as creative. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can, can I follow that? I mean, I, I agree with all of that. I think it's very. Um, I, I certainly think the the uh, analogy between free association and improvisation has to be right. Um, but I think there is some uh, there's a a funny sort of thing that happens. I mean, if you're coming at it more from a sort of classical music perspective, you might think, well, that wouldn't be quite the same because obviously with a a piece of classical music, you know, it's it's uh, organized in advance and you know how it's going to go and all the rest of it so you know it's not like that and yet i would think that in the it's, it's a very common experience that one of the sort of common experiences in a in a session is a kind of what a sense that the session is going right or the session is going wrong i think particularly you could have a sense that the session is going wrong <laughs> but you might not notice that the session is going right very often but you certainly from time to time, you have a sense that it's going wrong. Now, what does that mean? You know, because in a sense, you, you might think, well, if it's improvisatory and it's free association, anything can happen. And yet, that's not, somehow that's not quite true. Um, and also at the end of a session, after a session, perhaps looking back on the session, you might sometimes think, well, you know, it was a good session, but somehow it was rather fragmented or it didn't quite cohere or something. Or you might think the opposite. You might think, oh, for once, that session really sort of, it cohered, it had a sense. You might even say it had a sense of a beginning, a middle and the end. And quite yeah. often, it's a common experience, for example, in a supervision or in a seminar or something. But again, when you look back on a session, you can understand what the theme of the session was. You probably don't know what that is during the session itself, but some, when you look back on it, there's a sort of sense that some something has belonged together. So you can see what I'm driving at here, that even there, the sense of a, a classical music piece is also there. I think that's also an important analogy. I would say, of course, that in a, a really good performance of a piece of classical music, it mustn't sound prepared. It, you know, there has to be a sense of exploration and improvisation within the structure. Even, you know, that's what will make the piece really work. Um, when you're in the audience, you, you know, you don't, you don't want to feel it's all organized in advance, even though you know it is. You know, so there's a there's a, a paradox there, and I well, that, that's quite an interesting thing. I don't think I'd ever thought about that before this moment, but um, mm. I was just thinking, how can I? You know, Raphael particularly is he knows about the jazz. I, you know, I, I know a lot about classical music. How does it work? And I I think the two give a you know it's like having two eyes, isn't it? It's a slightly different perspective on the same phenomena. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Daniel. I think it's a, a beautiful analogy between uh, free association and improvisation. 
I played on the clarinet. I played both uh, jazz and the uh, shorts, and which also use improvisation and uh, and classical uh, repertoire as well. Um, but I think it's an analogy. There are some differences uh, between them. Uh, certain uh, rules that operate in one that are different in the other. For instance, uh, when a musician is doing a solo, improvising. Um, there, there is, you could say that uh, there is this absence of uh, a verbal mediation in his process of uh, free association, whereas in, in free association, um, these ideas that come to the to the artist or to the patient, uh, they should be uh, mediated. They should be uh, incorporated into words, and uh, the musician doesn't. Uh, maybe if, if it's a rap singer, he will have to. Uh, mm -hmm. But also, uh, I think that that uh, the, 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 a process similar to free association takes place during uh, any uh, whatsoever compositional process. But then, not only free association. Sometimes the composer have this musical idea, he saves this on a paper, and uh, he may return to it in the future. He may, uh, may make some modifications, adapt, change the key, uh, change the rhythm. Uh, but um, the, the, the way the idea, the musical idea is born, uh, somehow is similar uh, indeed to, to the the free association that takes place when the analyst allows the, the patient uh, to speak uh, whatever comes uh, to mind. Yes. Okay, uh, the, the, the question was because uh, free association uh, and improvis improvisation had rules, mm -hmm. special rules, and has uh, like, mm -hmm. uh, probably uh, described those rules. They are not uh, Free association has a logical, like improvisation also has a logical. That's the the the, the that's why mm -hmm. I, I try to put it in in mm -hmm. in the uh, yeah, song the the two concepts. No? It's not free free. It's free with with a special order. You know? mm -hmm. And improvisation also, Raphael, you 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 or or Daniel, you play the clarinet or the piano, and it has a structure. Is not play as I want, no, and it's describe the structure. Uh, so, well, I, I have one question that Mariano sent uh, sent me. Uh, I will make you to three of you, and it says, "I wonder how one can think about silence in an analytical session with deaf analysts. Mm. Can the silence be used as a psychic retreat?" Mm -hmm. I would say yes. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, everything, anything can be used as a defense, right? And and anything can be used as an invitation uh, to meet the patient where they are, you know. Uh, and we have to, uh, you know, hear things both ways. Um, I think working on the phone during the pandemic has been interesting in a mm. sense of silence on the phone. I find mm. very challenging and um, I've had to you know, do some interpretive work and explore this uh, because if I don't have any data uh, and, and the patient wishes to be on the phone, then um, I, I'm, I'm, I, I don't have any instruments <laughs> to fly my plane, but you know, anyway. But it's surprising, don't you? Haven't you found that sometimes, absolutely counterintuitively, silence on the phone sometimes has kind of worked? You know, yeah. I, I, I don't understand how it works because it shouldn't work, and and often it doesn't, just like you say. But I suppose the other, you know, there are lots of paradoxes. I think you know, silences in the in the room. I had one today. I I thought something was going on, and when finally the patient spoke. I discovered I was completely wrong. You know, the patient had quite another idea about 
what had been going on in the side. You know, so that and that you might think is a more more the sort of thing that might happen on the telephone, yeah. whereas in the mm -hmm. room, because you're in closer contact, usually and, and usually, you know, one is in in a greater kind of uh, non-verbal agreement or understand mm -hmm. comprehension or something. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> so many funny things can happen now. Well, mm -hmm. silence have meanings, no? That's also. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Daniel? Yes, there's, there is this uh, interesting work on uh, the meaning of silence in, in Handel. Uh, it's a whole book on the issue, <laughs> just on silence. And uh, I remember also one of my students at the, the lecture I gave at the University of Brasilia, she wanted to do uh, her paper, her monograph on silence as well and um, well i don't know how exactly how to address your question but uh, i'm pretty sure uh, silence uh, embodies uh, and express uh, lots of meanings yes meanings that, uh, eventually should be or should not uh, be addressed maybe not uh, instantly maybe with some patient, because uh, there are reasons uh, for silence to be at that particular moment as well. Mm -hmm. and, uh, um, addressing such reasons might cause uh, resistance, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I think it's, uh, there is an intuitive uh, way of dealing with uh, silence mm -hmm. during a session. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, well, I, I will read the second question. Um, the musicality in the session is a fundamental and basic fact that had always been there, but not acknowledged for so long. Why the deafness to this fact? It's difficult to know how to, I mean, there is a historical answer, and I, I alluded to that in my talk. I mean, I think Freud was very ambivalent um, about uh, about music. I think he, he said that he didn't like, he said it's a wonderful yeah. quote, because he says he doesn't like being moved by something when he doesn't understand how it's having that effect upon him. Now, yeah. that is, I, I, of course, we all like that quote, because it shows that it did have that effect on him. You know, that's, that's his point, you know, he is being moved by it. And yet the fact that he doesn't understand why that is, you know, was something that he didn't like. And I think Freud was very concerned to, to make sure that psychoanalysis really was a proper science. And uh, I, th I think he was, you know, he did find, I think, this kind of area uh, difficult. Although, of course, Freud is contradictory because, for example, he was, Sort of very interested in telepathy for example now you might think that the that, that you know that interest would have and i'm sure it does you know have some overlap with uh, musical communication but on the whole that's a kind of a little bit off to the side with freud that's not like the formal freud um so and I, but certainly i think that the um uh, I, i've read a couple of papers i mean i've written i've written about how um you know, that seems to have been an, an unconscious kind of veto, really, an embargo on writing about and, and discussing the musicality of the sessions for a very long time, you know. So even when um, in the 1950s, you know, the, the famous kind of papers on, on countertransference started to happen, they didn't really write about music. And you don't get that until the, the end of the 1970s and the 1980s. Anzio's paper, which I talk about with the sound bath, is revolutionary. It's an amazing thing. Um, so uh, it's a big question. But I think that, you know, I suppose that, um, you know, if I can just say one more thing. I mean, I think, I think it is very disturbing in a verbal treatment to think how, uh, you know, music is subversive. That's really what I'm trying to say. Music kind of it doesn't just operate and go according to the words. Music is often going against the words. Very often the music gets there before the words, you know, and often there's an understanding between analyst and patient on the musical level before they get there in the words. And sometimes I think they never get there in the words. 
you know, and this is meant to be a verbal treatment. So I think there is always a degree of antagonism between words and music. That's mm. uh, mm -hmm. Uh, I think it it takes places uh, it takes place at uh, so many levels during a clinical session. Um, one instance that uh, one issue that have been addressed in a couple of papers. There is one at the the, the American Journal of Psychoanalysis uh, where there is a, a discussion between an analyst and a composer and uh, about the heavy. I don't remember the the, the name of the two papers. Uh, but uh, it tells of uh, music that emerges uh, during a session, the, the, in the counter-transference or in the transference, the, the patient or, or the analyst mentions uh, music. Um, and uh, this is uh, quite interesting because I think sometimes uh, musical tastes have an impact uh, during the session, uh, uh, meaning that Sometimes both the patient and the uh, the, the analyst uh, have the the same clinical the same musical taste, and uh, but uh, is it good for the therapy? I don't know. I'm not sure. Oh, Maybe good. things this too close. Uh, the while the, the focus of the analysis may be diverted. But then, uh, if you have different musical tastes, uh, it may foster resistance both in the analyst and in the analyst. And so that this Maybe. is just. <laughs> uh, you know, Daniel, that happens a lot with uh, patients with adolescents because they they have a very different taste of music. They are listening to very modern music, and when they bring some uh, uh, examples or what 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 your playlist, I, I I always ask, what's your playlist? What you are listening now? And Music is absolutely different from what I like or what I'm listening. So that happens a lot. That's the uh, it's very different. And it's it's um a, like um como una generation difference. <laughs> oh yeah, and and I think that's that's not by accident. You know, it's it's I think music identity culture. You know, to belong to a group which is demarcated by your taste and. Uh, it's not. It's meant especially to be offensive to the previous generation, so that the, 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 that generation has their own music, which binds them together and loosens the boundaries between them and increases yeah. the boundaries and the separation from the other yeah. generation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I have another commentary, uh, Mariano sent me. Um, it's a commentary, not, it's not a question. Uh, en route to tuning into the music of the unconscious, just imagine the enormous value in including a musical improvisation group as part of psychoanalysis training. Exploring one's one music and musicality as a tool for greater understanding of the music between patient and analyst in the consulting room. That's a nice commentary. Mm. Good imagination. Mm. Uh, well, uh, when it comes to explore uh, one musicality, um, you might have noticed that I implied here today that at the core of the uh, corn complex of the kern com of the current complex of psychoanalysis is uh, somehow uh, at least partially musical uh, related so the freud's um, understanding of uh, mendelssohn's of, uh, of mendelssohn's antigone um, influenced him somehow in the creation in the adoption uh, we can say like that was uh, adopted as well uh, oedipus in the adoption of oedipus as a as a representative of uh, how he felt about his uh, his parents. So there, there's musicality there at the, the very core of the current complex. Yes, I, I really wanted to pick that up actually from, from Daniel's presentation because um, I, I think we often use, you know, Winnicott's wonderful work about transitional phenomena as a, as a way into to thinking about music. But you were talking about Antigone, and you used you even used the phrase, you know, the music of tragedies. Um, 
And I do think that um, we also need Hannah Siegel's wonderful work on aesthetics, really, um, and particularly the notion of a sort of destroyed world, you know, a, a world that is in, in pieces, an internal world that, is, that is, has been broken up by awful, awful forces. And, and that, the, that what is needed is to, to come to terms with the, with the guilt and the, the pain of it and gradually to rebuild this universe, you know, to make a new world, the world of reparation. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and, I, and, I, and particularly through the recognition of, of actually one's own part in the destruction of something that is really beautiful, like one's love for one's parents or something. And, you know, I, I, I did like you know, what I felt was kind of beneath your presentation, which was the incredible importance of the place of tragedy in, in psychoanalysis. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, uh, thank you. Raphael? Would, uh, no, I was curious from the, you know, from the two of you, uh, how you see, you know, like atonal music and more modern contemporary classical music. Is that what you would mean, Francis, in terms of not just the classics, but modern music that brings tension as the theme, lack of resolution, lack of tonal center, and that kind of existential state uh, represented by such music. And uh, Completely so. Completely so. Yeah, yeah. And it's in jazz, too, very much. Yes, yes, yes. And lots of, you know, as you know very well, you know, jazz has also become, you know, extremely exploratory in an atonal kind of way as well so that you know that that the notion of a, a much more fragmented world but nevertheless one that that is able to be represented and so the frame brings a kind of structure I, you know i suspect that this kind of music in any case has been very influenced by psychoanalysis yes you know the spirit of psychoanalysis has influenced the, the composition the compositional path as well as the other way around i think uh, I have the, uh, another question for Dr. Greer or Francis. Um, it says like this. I was wondering whether you could comment on the function of music as mediation. That is not only as the songs of rhythms of the analytical field, but music that may appear in the mind of the analyst giving figuration to certain emotional experience of the patient. Well, I, th I, uh, I, my own, my comment is, I, I think that happens often. I think, I think that um, just as, um, uh, you know, the free association of the analyst is really what we're talking about. All sorts of things happen to, in the mind of the of the analyst, and of course, this is now very much part of the theory of reverie. Um, but uh, anyway, if one just thinks about it as free association, you know, the analyst may think of a. Um, a picture, some words, or a, a television program or something, or they may think of a piece of music. And I think it's a common experience to think, oh God, that's a nuisance. I, I shouldn't be thinking about that piece of music. Well, you know, and, and, and you have to sort of pinch yourself and think, oh, something valuable may be happening. This could be a free association, not just me not concentrating, <laughs> not focusing, you know, and 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 then you know, you might, you might be able to work out at some stage or other, you might be able to work out why that is. There is a lovely, lovely version of it. <laughs> this I remember reading in one, one paper, I can't remember what the paper was, but it was some uh, patient who was talking a lot in session after session after session about how unhappy his mother was She'd been widowed and he had to live in another country. And so his mother was terribly, terribly unhappy. Until one day, the analyst started to hear this tune in his head. And he worked out afterwards that it was the, the tune of the Merry Widow, the famous words from the Merry Widow. This had occurred to him that it was quite possible that this mother was not nearly as sad as the patient wanted his mother to be without him. So. Mm -hmm. nice. Um, well, be, be, before we are uh, ending the, the webinar, I, I want to, uh, I don't know if you remember the, um, the book of Theodor Reich in the 1948 that uh, was listening to the third, uh, with the third year, mm -hmm. remember? Mm -hmm. And, and he, the, the 
he, he argued the, in that book that the analyst listened with a third ear, mm -hmm. uh, the voice that comes from the unconscious. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I, I think that this idea was mm -hmm. always going around mm -hmm. the, the presentations, mm -hmm. the questions, and uh, mm -hmm. we, are, we are working with our third ear always. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so well, thank you everyone for your participation, the audience on Daniel, Raphael, and Francis. It was very nice uh, joining this webinar and even being with you and uh, trying to mix your opinions in. It was very nice. Uh, I will thank Mariano uh, Ruperut. Uh, he is, was helping with us with the questions. Thanks, Matthew Grimley, with the technical support. And uh, I would like to announce uh, the, the next uh, webinar. Join our LinkedIn discussion group for the further discussion. Uh, the next link, the next webinar will be will take place June 13th uh, at the same time, and uh, um, the title is the role of suggestion in a fast word. So I hope you will be there next webinar, and thank you again, Daniel, Raphael, and Francis. It was very nice joining you and. Okay, bye. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.